The topic of this week's lecture will be a technique in quantum algorithms called quantum walks. This is an analog of the classical algorithmic framework of random walks, which we will describe first. Then we will see how to quantize a, a random walk. We begin with a classic application of a randomized walk, finding your way out of a maze. Imagine that you are at the green point and want to find your way to the exit at the red point. How can you do it? Here you are meant to walk on the lines, not in the corridors. There is actually a path connecting the green and red dots. Here's, here's an example in, of one you can see with a faint yellow line. So how can you solve the maze problem? How can you determine if there is a path between two vertices of a graph and find such a path if there is one? There are two classic algorithms to do this, breadth first search and depth first search. Both can be done in time order n plus m, where the graph has n vertices and m edges. And both have space complexity order of n. So both of these algorithms are pretty good in terms of time complexity. But what if you want to find your way out of a maze and you have a terrible memory? What if you don't want to use so much space? Then you can just try walking randomly. In a random walk, when you're at a vertex, you choose uniformly at random which neighbor of that vertex to go to next. You can show that if a graph G has n vertices and m edges, and u and v are two vertices of G that are connected, that is, there exists a path between them, then a random walk will reach v from u within order m times n many steps in expectation. While the time complexity is therefore worse than breadth or depth for a search, the only thing you have to remember is the name of the node you are currently at. So we can always upper bound m times n by n cubed. So we can say that the time complexity of this algorithm is order n cubed. But for the space complexity, all that we have to do is remember the name of the node that we're at. So this algorithm actually takes logarithmic space. Now let's try to get some intuition for why this fact is true. We are going to restrict ourselves to D regular graphs. That is graphs where every vertex has exactly D neighbors. In the picture here, we have an example of a four regular graph. Now let me more formally describe what a random walk on a deregular graph is. Let's say that we start our walk at vertex V. In a random walk on this graph, we repeat the following process until we reach the vertex we are looking for. At a generic step of the walk, when we're at vertex U, then we just roll a D-sided die. If the outcome is J, then we move to the jth neighbor of u. And we just keep repeating this process. Let's look at how the prob probability we are at each node of the graph evolves under this process. So to, to, do, to do this, let's define pt of a to be the probability that we are at node a after t steps of the walk. Say that we just start our walk at vertex 0. So p0 of 0 is equal to 1, and p0 of i is equal to 0 for any other vertex i. After one step of the walk, we have probability 1 quarter to be at any of the four neighbors of vertex 0 and we have probability zero to be anywhere else. So you can see the illustration of one, one step of the walk here in this picture. 
Now I'm going to represent the probability distribution PT by a vector, as shown here. The dimension of the vector is simply the number of nodes in the graph. So the ith entry of this vector, the ith entry of the vector PT is just PT of i the probability to be at vertex i after t steps of the walk. In our example here, you see that p0 is just a standard basis vector that is 1 in the 0th position. And now p1, so after one step of the walk, we evolve into the, ve to the vector p1, which is 1 quarter on vertices 1, 4, 5, and 8, which are the neighbors of vertex 0. We can easily express the evolution of the vector PT in terms of what is called the normalized adjacency matrix of the graph. I'm going to call this matrix A. The adjacency matrix, in our case where the graph is unweighted, is just a 0, 1 matrix that indicates the presence or absence of an edge between any two vertices. So the i, j entry of the adjacency matrix is 1 if and only if there is an edge between vertex i and vertex j. In the normalized adjacency matrix, we normalize the matrix so that each column sums to 1. In our case, as we restrict to d regular graphs, this means that we simply multiply the adjacency matrix by 1 over d to arrive at the normalized adjacency matrix. So here I've written the normalized adjacency matrix for our example graph here. The normalized adjacency matrix tells us exactly how the probability distribution PT evolves. P sub t plus 1 is just a times pt. As in the first example we saw of the walk starting at vertex 0, it is clear that for any standard basis vector ei, the probability distribution after one step of a walk starting at vertex i is just a times ei. The fact that p sub t plus 1 is equal to a times pt then follows by linearity of multiplication by a. This means that if our walk starts at vertex a, then after t steps of the random walk, our probability distribution over vertices will be given by a to the power t times ea, where again ea is the standard basis vector corresponding to vertex a. This means that to understand the evolution of a random walk, we need to understand the behavior of a to the power t. Because we have a deregular graph, every row and every column of our normalized adjacency matrix sums to 1. This means that a times the all1 vector will again be the all1 vector. In other words, the all1 vector is an eigenvector of A. Similarly, for U being the vector representing the uniform distribution, that is the vector where every entry is 1 divided by n, we will also have that A times U is equal to U. The uniform distribution is what is called a stationary distribution for this walk. Once our probability distribution over the vertices becomes the uniform distribution, it will no longer change as we keep walking, thus the name stationary. The adjacency matrix is a symmetric matrix, so we know it will have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Let's say these eigenvectors are v1 through vn, and they are sorted in decreasing order in terms of their eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda n. Okay, so lambda 1, of course, is the largest eigenvalue. Lambda 2 is at most lambda 1, etc. We have already seen that 1 
is an eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenvector, all of whose entries are 1. Or to make it a unit vector, we can consider all of its entries to be equal to 1 divided by square root of n. As the eigenvectors are orthogonal, this means that the sum of the entries of any other eigenvector must be 0. The adjacency matrix is also non-negative. The perone frobenius theorem says that the largest mag magnitude eigenvalue corresponds to an eigenvector with non-negative entries. And the only eigenvector with non-negative entries is the all one eigenvector. Therefore, the largest magnitude of an eigenvalue of A is 1. It is known that the eigenvalues can actually tell us more about the graph. If the graph is connected, then the second largest eigenvalue must be strictly less than 1. And if the graph is not bipartite, then the least eigenvalue will be strictly greater than negative 1. From now on, we will assume that the graph is not bipartite and is connected. With these assumptions, then the all one eigenvector is the sole eigenvector with eigenvalue of magnitude 1. All other eigenvalues are strictly smaller in magnitude. Suppose that the next largest magnitude of an eigenvalue is 1 minus delta. Delta is called the spectral gap of the graph. We now, con we now consider an arbitrary starting distribution over the vertices. Let's call this starting distribution P0. You can think of this as before as being fully concentrated on a single vertex, but the proof works in general. We can write P0 as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. So that's what I've done here. We've written P0 as a sum from i equals 1 to n of alpha i times vi. What we are really interested in is alpha 1, which is the dot product of P0 with V1. Again, V1 is our eigenvector whose entries are 1 divided by square root of n. Now we know that P0 is a probability distribution, so 1 is equal to the sum of the entries of P0. In other words, 1 is equal to the dot product of the all 1 vector with P0. All other eigenvectors, V2 through Vn, are orthogonal to the all one vector. So the dot product of the all one vector with P0 is simply alpha one times the dot product of the all one vector and V1. This in turn is equal to alpha one times the square root of n. This shows that alpha one is just one divided by square root of n. So this means that alpha 1 times v1 is the uniform distribution. After t steps of the walk, our probability distribution over vertices is a to the power t times p0. This is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of alpha i times lambda i to the power t times vi. Now look at the first term in the sum. Lambda 1 is 1, so lambda 1 to the power t is also 1. So the first term in the sum is simply alpha 1 times v1, which we have seen is the uniform distribution. So I've pulled out uh, this first term in the sum here, the uniform distribution. Now this additional term, the sum from i equals 2 to n of alpha i times lambda i to the power t, times vi, we're going to show that the L2 norm of this term becomes small as t increases. For convenience, I'm going to refer to this sum now as the error term. Okay, specifically, let's look at the square of the L2 norm of our probability distribution after t steps of the walk minus the uniform distribution. This is simply the L2 norm squared of the error term. Since the eigenvectors are orthogonal, 
the L2 norm squared of the sum here in the first line will simply be equal to the sum of the L2 norm squared of the terms. So this is what I've written on the second line. Now we know that each eigenvalue lambda i for i greater than one is at most one minus delta in magnitude. So lambda i to the power two t is at most one minus delta to the power two t in magnitude. I've plugged in this bound in the third line here. Finally, we know that the term sum from i equals two to n alpha i squared norm squared of vi is at most the norm squared of p0. And the norm squared of p0 is at most 1, because p0 has a 1 norm equal to 1. So this shows that the L2 norm of the error term is at most 1 minus delta to the power t. In other words, the spectral gap controls how quickly the walk converges to the uniform distribution. More specifically, if we run the walk for a number of steps that's proportional to 1 divided by delta, then the deviation from the uniform distribution becomes a small constant. And we can get as close as we want to the uniform distribution by running the walk for log 1 divided by eta divided by delta many steps. In this case, our deviation from the uniform distribution in L2 norm becomes at most eta. The same kind of idea we have seen here is used in what's called the power method to compute the principal eigenvector of a matrix. If this matrix has a spectral gap, then starting with a random vector, so long as this random vector has some overlap with the principal eigenvector, if we repeatedly apply A to this random vector, then we will converge to the principal eigenvector of A. Okay, so to back up and summarize here, we have seen that a random walk on a deregular, connected, and non-bipartite graph converges to the uniform distribution. We can guarantee fast convergence when the graph has a large spectral gap. This should give you some intuition for why randomly choosing where to go at each juncture in a maze, you will eventually find your way out of the, out of the maze, if there is a way out.